welcome to our um, Future Urban Ventilation Network workshop today around um, air quality metrics. So the idea of today is that we want to um, share through, through, we've got four speakers, fantastic speakers who, who will um, be there this morning, um, and to just start thinking about the complexities and challenges and what we can do in terms of indoor air quality metrics um, and how they relate to health. Um, so the idea is to stimulate some, some thoughts um, and um, sort of ideas around this whole topic. Just before that, for those of you who are not familiar, I'd like to introduce the Future Urban Ventilation Network or otherwise known as Breathing City. Um, so if you're not already part of us, these are our contact details on here. We are um, a network that is um, um, funded through uh, the UKRI uh, Clean Air Programme, um, which is support, um, administered by NERC. Um, and the network itself brings together um, academic partners with uh, practitioners to really think through the whole of the complexities around how we ventilate buildings and how the indoor and outdoor air exchanges um, influence the air, the quality of the air we breathe and hence the health effects of that. So these are the organisations that are involved in the leadership of the network um, and these are the, the people who are in the um, investigator team who are, who are driving the network forward and organising these events and, and activities. Um, many of you will have been to, to some of these previously. Um, so the, just to give you a bit of background on the network, why we, we created this network, beyond the fact there was a funding opportunity, um, was to focus around the aspects of airflow. So we see a lot of um, measurement of pollution uh, or uh, air quality parameters, both outdoors and indoors. But actually, if we want to understand how the, those um, exposures happen, we need to also understand the airflow that drives those exposures. And we can't mitigate air quality without understanding airflow. So we need this to interpret our measurements and to be able to uh, predict exposures. But we also know that the physics of this is really challenging. Um, we can't just look at indoor flow or outdoor flow on its own. We have to think about them together. Um, and we know that it's, it, there's a whole complexity of different time and length scales associated with understanding those flows. Um, I think the other big driver for us is that we can't just look at air quality and health on it in isolation. We have to think of all the other surrounding factors in there, including the you know, energy and climate impacts of how we ventilate buildings comfort, which we could argue is part of indoor environmental quality, um, aspects such as noise, security, even, you know, insects and things. So we have a whole raft of different factors that have to be included in there. Um, the other big driver for us, which I think is where today really comes in, is that ventilation of buildings is not, um, the, the parameters we use are not there because of health reasons, they're there often for a sort of balance of energy and comfort. And we need to think about how we consider health and behavior in there much better. And as you know, the UK is, is not uh, alone in this. We have a legacy of infrastructure that, that we know is not fit for its purpose. It doesn't provide the right indoor air quality. So we need to think about how we connect that up better and improve those, that infrastructure. So the, the network itself is split into three key themes, thinking about how we couple indoor and outdoor flows, thinking about how we um, explore health centre ventilation, and then thinking about the practice side of that, the regulation practice and guidance that actually frames a lot of the, um, the, the physical uh, and parameters of the, of the buildings that we're involved with. Um, the programme itself does not drive research because it's a network but it, it will carry out some pilot projects it will bring people together and demonstrate how we can perhaps come up with a better framework for how we do this so the objectives of the the network are around scoping this framework how do we integrate health evidence flow design and today is a big part of that thinking about how we actually initiate new research projects to 
uh, fill some of the gaps in knowledge, thinking about how we can develop partnerships between academia and uh, researchers and practitioners um, and through into policy makers to, to try and join all of this up. And then what are the requirements that are needed to actually change things um, from a, uh, to give us a move to a health-based approach to ventilation design. Um, just give a little bit more detail on the theme. So theme one, which is led by Malcolm Cook at Loughborough and Martin Van Riedrich at um, uh, Imperial, focuses on the, the sort of more the physics around how do we do ingress and egress of pollutants in buildings? How can we model this? How can we use data sets together? How can we characterize aspects like human behavior? And thinking about the differences between different building types um, and then opportunities from things like sensors. Theme two, which focuses very much more on ventilation, uh, is led by Abigail Hathaway at um, Sheffield and Henry Burridge at Imperial, focuses on what's the evidence base for health and exposure parameters. Again, that's quite relevant to today. Um, and the challenges of understanding the uncertainties in, uh, in the indoor environment. Um, and then also thinking through what some of the technology requirements are. And then the final theme, which is bringing city into practice, which is Tim Sharp leading it, focuses on um, how we can engage with policy and users at different scales, including thinking about sort of citizen science type studies where we can engage the public in research. <laughs> so just to go into where we are today, um, I'm going to hand over in a moment to uh, Jim Stewart Evans from Public Health England, who's going to just talk a little bit through some early work we've been doing about map, the systems type map for thinking about air quality. We've then got, I'm uh, really pleased we've got four fantastic speakers who are going to give some different perspectives on um, indoor air and outdoor air quality uh, and thinking through some of the metrics that we might be needing to use uh, to consider uh, the joining up indoor and outdoor air and health. Um, we will then do an offline activity, which is uh, relatively simple. I'll talk about it in a minute and introduce it again later. And then we'll finish up uh, with a, a Q&A session and sort of panel discussion for open discussion. So if you've got questions that you have for speakers, there will be a little bit of time for questions after each speaker. So please put that in the chat panel. Um, Talks will be on uh, YouTube afterwards as well if you've missed stuff. And just general housekeeping, which is, you know, please keep yourself muted if you're not speaking today. Um, just to introduce the, the uh, offline session, we will use a Padlet type uh, approach. There will be a whole set of questions. These are uh, we might have just changed these very slightly since we wrote this slide, but uh, basically you can go in, you can put your comments in, you can vote on comments um, and you can respond to comments. So we're hoping that this will be a way of doing a bit of um, online dialogue and discussion um, amongst people. Um, so we, we will um, give, share that link a little bit later on this morning um, so people can get into that. Um, and then just to finally say a few things to um, uh, around the network. Um, if you're not already part of our network and you're keen to be on our mailing list, please get in touch with us. We don't spam you with lots of emails. Um, we've got um, our, we're running a, a, set, a policy event in late September. Um, but that, that as an invite only event, that one. But we will be starting our seminar series again in October and we have all of our past events on the YouTube channel. We also have two surveys which are open at the moment. We have a survey aimed at ventilation practitioners. Um, so if you work in ventilation sector, we're keen to hear from you. Um, and then we also have another survey about a repository. We're quite keen to put together an approach for data sets around indoor and urban air quality. Um, so there's a survey there if you've got data and you'd be interested in putting data into a repository. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Jim, who's just going to very briefly introduce some of the work on the systems map that we've been doing before I introduce this morning speakers. Thanks, Kath. Um, so uh, before I show um, version of our system map. I'm, I have a bit of a story really to, to tell, I think. 
um, in the within the within this network, we've got a range of specialists and, and interests, and we have people who are experts in modeling flows and the dispersion of pollutants. We've got experts in building design and construction, experts in the passive and active ventilation of buildings. And my colleague Christos and I um, represent Public Health England in our focus is air quality and health. And one of the aims of the core for these networks was to address health outcomes and vulnerable groups in the population. Um, so we started off some of the work within Breathing City, thinking about how we make people's health relevant to all these different professional interests within the network. Um, and typically you might consider a source pathway receptor model. So if we did that, we'd need to characterize sources of outdoor and indoor pollutants. So we'd be considering types of pollutants and emission rates. Then we'd be thinking about environmental concentrations of pollutants in outdoor and indoor air over time and, and in space, and then people's exposures to them and the resulting health effects. And if we did that, we can look at the chain that goes from emissions to then exposures and people's health. Um, but we realized that would be too simple. And it's, it's not just about air pollution in indoor environments either. And what brings us together within the network ultimately is a shared interest in the relationship between indoor environments and people. And buildings are designed for people and used by people. And those indoor environments influence people's behavior and people's behavior influences in turn indoor environments. So for example, when we notice it's too hot or damp indoors, we might open doors and windows or turn on mechanical ventilation and that increases air exchange between the indoor and outdoor environments. The temperature might change, indoor concentrations of pollutants change. And later on, we might worry about security, leaving our windows open or we might be disturbed by outdoor noise, end up closing our windows and then the indoor environment changes again. So there's a constant balancing act between the outdoor and indoor environments and our behavior and what we're exposed to indoors and our health. Um, most of us might not even be thinking in terms of exposures and pollution. It, it might be that temperature and thermal comfort are really the obvious drivers. We can feel them and respond to them. And in many ca cases, pollution might be unseen and it's just there. Um, in the background. So when we've been thinking through this, we started to um, realize that a systems approach might help us to visualize some of these um, connections. And I'll share my screen um, with an example. Uh, hopefully that's come up. Um, so this simple map um, is, is an overview of some of the connections between outdoor and indoor environments and the design and use of buildings and behavior and exposures and health. Um, so there's a, there's a much more detailed version behind this and we'll share a link um, to that uh, later on today. And that includes more on some of the um, headline um, things you can see in the boxes here. Um, so in terms of building um, and ventilation characteristics in use, so it could be things like air tightness and means of ventilation and outdoor environmental factors would be things like pollution sources and, and weather outdoors, indoor environments, um, things like indoor pollution sources, perhaps processes that attenuate pollutants during air exchange and over time indoors. And then specific hazards and exposures and pollutants that not just different air pollutants, but also things like noise and biological hazards and temperature that, that Kaf's mentioned earlier. And then the specific health outcomes that we might be interested in. So cardiorespiratory disease is, is one of the obvious areas, but also things like mental health and well-being and temperature related outcomes if we're considering um, temperature as a driver of, of health effects. So uh, to conclude really that, that people's exposures and health and thinking about health and health metrics, it depends on outdoor environments. It depends on indoor environments. It depends on the design and use of our buildings, and it depends on behavior. And all these things are connected. Um, they're also all potentially relevant today when we when we consider metrics. That in that conversation around metrics, we think it, it's important to consider all of these areas and how they're connected, and how some of the things that we might want to measure lead on to exposures and, and health. Um, so I'll leave it there, I think. And um, 
that probably sets us up to, to go into our speakers. And um, I don't know, Kath, if you will be introducing our, our first speaker. After yes, that. I will. So many thanks, Jim, for just that sort of brief overview of, of sort of where we're thinking around system map. So, yeah, really pleased today that we've managed to get some four excellent speakers. And our first speaker this morning, um, somebody I know, known for a long time, Pavel Wilgocki, at uh, uh, Associate Professor from uh, the Department of Civil Engineering at the Technical University of Denmark. Um, so Pavel has worked in this area of indoor air quality and health effects for uh, probably too long now, Pavel, <laughs> <That's> long, <laughs> quite a while, um, but has been particularly focused around aspects around um, indoor air metrics here. So has a re active research project around energy efficient indoor air quality management in residential buildings and thinking about rating methods for performance assessment and optimization of energy efficiency <laughs> for managing indoor air. Um, Pavel's a, a fellow of the um, International Society of Indoor Air Quality and he's currently the president of the Academy of Fellows. So really pleased to have you today to talk with us and over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kath, and thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Um, do you want to share your screen and see if we can get that to work too? <laughs> Some problems, so sorry. Well, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? We can we can hear you, Pavel. It should be okay now. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm I'm losing my precious minutes um, of my presentation. Thank you. I'm so sorry for the troubles. Always happens to me. I'm so clumsy. Anyway, thank you very much for the invitation uh, for this uh, extremely important topic. Uh, that has been actually on my mind uh, and many people's mind for, for years. And uh, if I may start my presentation and share it. Um, all right. And then, okay. And now. All right, uh, it should be this one. No, this one. Sure. Okay. So sorry. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I prepared a, a long presentation, but I'll jump among, between the different slides and I'll make the slides available to everyone. Um, I think it is an important topic because I would like to start my presentation by um, basically saying that um, in, a night, in a few years back, we published a paper on the um, um, indoor air quality in green buildings, where we said that the necessity for IQ metric is crucial now and is a significant barrier holding back innovation of technologies that support indoor air quality. I just want to tell you that we have metrics you know, and uh, labels for many other aspects in life. Uh, and also if we, if we talk uh, uh, about buildings, we have, uh, you know, labels for materials, we have labels for energy, but uh, we are not having a metric uh, that uh, we agreed on with respect to indoor air quality. And I think developing this metric fairly quick uh, is uh, important for many aspects, not only aspect of the te technological development, also for benchmarking buildings and improving generally air quality in buildings, but also because of the literacy. Uh, people, of course, thanks to COVID, uh, we should not say that thanks to COVID, but because of COVID, there is more and more interest in indoor uh, problems. However, we need to really document that and um, make um, a step forward by basically developing a method in which people can uh, refer to some sort of a reference, some sort of a benchmark. And a metric uh, for that purpose is necessary. However, and this is my presentation uh, that I'm going to, to give you, 
There have been several efforts and there is no metric at the moment. I'll give you today a little bit of the review of what has been uh, considered and is considered as a metric and also what could be the potential strategies for setting an index of indoor air quality. I think we should start by discussing what is the indoor air quality. And there are several definitions of indoor air quality. And I, I'm not going to go through all of those uh, um, uh, definitions. They are available online and there have been also published in uh, several publications. Also our recent publication in energy and building and buildings. <laughs> However, the important thing is that the metric should consider all relevant air pollutants. And these include both particulate matter gaseous pollutant and biological agents. Unfortunately, the metric of the indices that have been used so far focused on specific aspects of the, uh, the entire um, environment, I would say, of uh, indoor air pollutants uh, in buildings. Um, and um, neglecting some of, uh, some of them and importance of some of them. If we look uh, historically, or if we look now, what uh, kind of metrics uh, have been used? So the most used metric of uh, indoor air quality is actually ventilation. So we basically equate ventilation with the uh, indoor air quality. If we say the ventilation is high, we think that the indoor air quality is good. If we say ventilation is slow, indoor air quality is poor. This is true under certain conditions, uh, and I will come back to this in a moment. Then there, were, there are other indices that have been used to characterize indoor air quality, including carbon dioxide, which is used now, TVOC, which is total concentration of volatile organic compounds, and uh, acceptability of um, um, uh, ratings of air quality made by uh, people. Let's go back to ventilation. And I think it's important because this is a network that discuss ventilation. And there are several beliefs and misconceptions of ventilation. So if we want to use ventilation as a marker of indoor air quality, uh, uh, so we really need to understand those um, uh, limitations. So as I said, we think that more ventilation always improves indoor air quality, which may not be the case for the specific types of pollutants. Then the lack of ventilation or low ventilation means poorer quality. It does not always mean poorer quality with respect to the certain types of pollutants and if the source control is applied. Ventilation will effectively remove all pollutants in spite of their type, which I said is not always the case. And then there is uh, an issue that this is not simple to measure ventilation. Uh, and ventilation is also very dynamic. It changes over time. So we don't know whether it should be an uh, immediate measure or a long-term measurement. So which type of ventilation should be used to determine the quality of indoor environment? And also it will depend on the type of the effects that we see. Are we looking for the acute effects? Are we looking for the chronic effects? And so on and so on. So uh, <clears throat> ventilation can be used to predict human responses. And so it's a performance-based metric. However, we have to remember, and I think this is an important and also an important, how to say, conclusion of the project that was sponsored by European Commission um, 10 years ago uh, on designing or defining health-based ventilation requirements in buildings. Uh, and the project was HealthVent. And one of the major conclusions was that ventilation is only a modifying factor. So what we should be focusing is the exposures, not only ventilation, because the exposures affect our health and comfort and the exposures can be modified not only by ventilation, but also by other means. And this is where the metric is so important, because if we think about uh, uh, indoor air quality metric, we think about the exposure. So we can just say that this is simple and relatively easy to verify ventilation uh, today, but um, it is not a very solid or credible metric for predicting indoor air quality. It has certain limitations. 
Then go, we go to the carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide is probably the longest in history used the metric or considered as the important parameter in indoor environment. I don't have time to discuss all of the entire history behind the CO2, but probably the most important is that since the 19th century, uh, we have um, a pattern cover uh, level of the CO2, which is 1000 PM, which is a marker of um, poor air quality but not, uh, it's only a marker of poor air quality or poor ventilation. And it's still used as such. CO2 is basically used as the uh, marker of ventilation efficiency. So it contains pros and cons of all of uh, ventilation. And it's very much dynamic, much more probably dynamic than ventilation because it all depends on uh, emissions on ventilation on uh, um, number of factors um, mixing um, uh, of the air or air distribution in spaces also the thermal environments and so on that all affect the levels of co2 um, that are measured so as seems to be very simple it has also uh, its own limitations it is an indicative metric but probably not capturing all types of pollutants that we would like to capture. Additionally, CO2 would not scale up, um, how to say, uh, there would be no relationship, uh, proportional relationship between the levels of CO2 and some pollutants. So um, changing CO2 may not mean that some pollutants, other pollutants also would change in the same manner. And the TVOC, I think, it's important to discuss because in, because in today's uh, uh, world, we are using more and more sensor technology that is actually providing information on TVOC. However, we don't know what it means when the TVOC is measured by many of those sensors that are deployed, low-cost sensors. Basically, TVOC has been proposed in the past and has been defined as the um, as the uh, uh, mass uh, addition of masses of polluting molecules between C6, so carbon, so pollutants with six, six carbon atoms and 16 carbon atoms. So only this window of pollution has been considered for the TPO. So you can see there is a limitation of it when we use it, even if we follow the definition, because we are only looking at the specific window of pollutants. And there have been a Hmm. propose those response relationships for TVOC. TVOC in a concept is very interesting concept because it is actually looking at the different pollutants, uh, but only ga gas phase pollutants. So that's the limitation. However, even though the relationships have been established, the, uh, in 97, there was a paper published that TVOC is not a risk factor for health and comfort. Basically, it, it was not documented that it, there is a relation to, um, to, this, um, to this indicator uh, between health and uh, comfort uh, parameters. Then, and for years, and it's reflected also in many standards, also in the new European standard for ventilation and also in national standard is that use of human assessments. So people can assess the rate, the air quality, and we can use their uh, assessments to set the levels of indoor quality. Of course, we will be rating only those pollutants that we are able to perceive. There will be a, a, a range of uh, harmful pollutants that we are not able to perceive, but they should be addressed uh, differently. Now, we would immediately know whether people um, are comfortable or discomfortable or are satisfied or dissatisfied with the environment. That's advantage of that metric. However, the metric, if we use this metric, is that um, you know, we don't have a specific measuring scale. There are different factors that influence the, our evaluation and the precision and repeatability of that, including uh, different endpoints for sensory comfort, lengths of exposure, and also uh, thermodynamic uh, parameters characterizing indoor air will also affect our assessment. So this is also probably 
some approach that has uh, specific limitations. So if we if we look at all the drawbacks of previous attempts is that they address mainly exposures to chemical compounds. Usually one modality is addressed is a comfort modality. And um, there is an arguable reliability and repeatability of it and is mostly related to ventilation compliance. There have been other proposed multiple pollutant metrics and they were based on only VOC measurements or integration of different pollutants, addition of different pollutants. But if you look at the list, it's probably there have been maybe five, six, maybe seven other types of uh, attempts. None has been uh, applied. Recently, the topic has been brought back because of the um, a need to, how to say, renovate buildings, reduce energy, and also secure that this uh, changes to the building energy performance will not produce changes to uh, indoor environmental quality. So within that, uh, within the Annex 68, which is the Annex that has been completed and supported by International Energy Agency on indoor air quality design and control in low energy buildings. This is the paper that was published. There was a proposal for the metric that can be used to assess the air quality in buildings that undergo um, uh, energy retrofit. And this metric was developed based on um, the actual measurements of pollutants or the measure pollutants in the low energy buildings and their exposure limits. And 16 target pollutants have been selected for that purpose. And the, um, their concentrations, or I mean, um, the metric is based on the long-term exposure limits and short-term exposure limits. So there are two metrics sort of, and that is also one metric that is related to disability adjusted life years. So the metric looks like that, that looks at the short-term acute effects, long-term chronic effects, and also look at the DALI, DALI levels for all the 16 pollutants that were selected based on the measurements that were done in the low energy buildings. Recently also another metric has been proposed or other rating schemes that looks holistically on the indoor environmental quality and it's called TAIL. And it's a rating schemes that look at the thermal acoustic indoor air quality and la, uh, luminous environment. And then there is an aspect of indoor, uh, uh, of indoor air quality, which is an eye um, parameter in the scheme. And in this, um, in this metric, 12 IQ, uh, 12 IQ parameters were selected and few indoor air quality uh, parameters. There is no metric of indoor air quality, so few were selected and they were based on what is required in the ventilations, in the ventilation um, standards and also by the, uh, uh, by the guidelines of the WHO. So you will see here both ventilation and CO2 as a marker of ventilation but also pollutants that are all listed by uh, WHO, such as formaldehyde, benzene, PM. So the metric is um, trying to put together comfort and health in, into one uh, pa parameter, but it's not combining it, but suggests that those parameters should be measured. Then there is a question about the quality and DALI parameters, whether they could be used as the uh, potential metric uh, for the future. So I will not go through the definition of both, but uh, <clears throat> I think DALI and the usefulness of DALI approach has been especially presented by the analysis that were uh, made uh, uh, by the uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab and Jennifer Locke uh, published in also nearly 10 years ago when she was looking at the measurements, this is down figure, measurements of pollutants in buildings in the United States, and then try to put some <clears throat> um, estimate of their importance with respect to health uh, effects. And this, uh, this actually, as you can see, there are several pollutants with different levels, but in the end, she, was a, she said that only few of them have importance for, with respect to health, among others were PM2.5 acrolein, formaldehyde, and ozone, which had a DALI above one. All others, uh, according to the evidence that there was present then, uh, have not been uh, uh, considered or they were not considered as the pollutants of concern. 
there will be a continuation of that work. In he just started a new annex, Annex 86, which is on energy efficient IQ management in residential buildings. And there is a specific subtask on metrics and development of an IQ management strategy. And the leader of this is Benjamin uh, Jones uh, from University of Nottingham. So to summarize, rather than to give you conclusions of what I present, is to maybe start a discussion and maybe inspiration on how we should proceed. And I um, uh, def defined uh, some sort of a potential roadmap on how we could develop the metric in the future for indoor air quality. And I think uh, we need to um, address uh, or answer three important questions. Why, why we need the, the metric? So what is the purpose? What, how to define uh, this uh, metric and how, uh, what are the markers of that? So if we speak about why, so define the purpose of the metric. So that could be several aspects is that could be a stamp of indoor air quality. It may alert building occupants. So maybe only for that purpose, uh, avoid negative uh, effects on humans. So it could be just pass, not pass. Predict the size of the effects on humans. So that for the risk estimation, it can be for the control of building systems or basically combination of all. But I think it's important to understand that there could be different reasons why we develop the metric and the metric can be formed differently if those different reasons are taken into account. So maybe the metric that we develop or in the future may not uh, submit to all those requirements that are listed here. And that could be many more of those. So what should be measured? So what should be the performance criteria? So far, we've been looking on comfort uh, as a metric. But uh, there could be other uh, aspects, of course, health. And uh, Kath was talking about health. And then we, when we talk about health, we should be thinking about whether we are looking at acute effects, chronic or toxic chronic effects. And then of course, the metric could be productivity or learning uh, as the uh, compliance criteria. And that could be <clears throat> combination of above. The metric can also be defined to especially look at the sensitive individuals. And I know that I'm over time, but I'm just finishing one more slide, so sorry. And then how we develop the metric is that, uh, 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 what pollutants we should include. So the, the, should it be a single pollutant? Should we have a group of, of contaminants? Or should we have, my wife is calling. Um, so com, uh, there should be combined effects uh, in a new metrics or other approaches. I think that there is also important uh, research that it, uh, needs to be performed in order to support the development of metric. So first of all, we need to map pollutants and responses in buildings. So, um, so far, we all the measurements that have been performed are uh, short-term measurements, no long-term measurements and changes of pollutants in buildings have been done. And there is a possibility to continue this or make this happen now with, of course, advanced sensor technology. And also collecting the data from many buildings. Then how we are mapping uh, human physiological parameters. And I think how we as a humans respond. And uh, Joe Allen from Harvard proposed to develop health performance indicators for that purpose. So that could be one way of uh, advancing this. And um, also we could examine efficiency of pragmatic solutions. I mean, there could be some simple solutions to solve that. I'll stop here. Uh, long presentation, but I probably made a, a little bit too long, but sorry for that. And I hope um, that uh, in the presentation uh, provides some inspiration to you in your consideration and discussions about the uh, in the network. Thanks a lot. Thank you ever so much, Pavel. That was a really good sort of <laughs> overview, really, of, of all of the, the, the challenges and, yeah. and past work around um, and ongoing work around indoor ag metrics. I think we will just take a couple of very quick questions. Um, so I've got a question from Noel who said, haven't the health and safety at work sector looked at the indoor environment with regard to exposure to harmful substances? Is there anything we can learn from their efforts? I think there is some, uh, but you know, um, 
The problem with the um, all the metrics that uh, exist now is that uh, basically it's so-called lamp post effect. We know that there are some pollutants and they, those pollutants that we are were able and are able to measure, have been able to measure, they are considered, but there are a range of pollutants that have not been considered. Also, there could be combined effects, uh, um, um, modifying effects uh, of other pollutants. One important point here is that we should start following the recommendations that are now. For example, WHO recommends certain levels, but still we see the levels of pollutants higher in buildings, right? So without changing this uh, to basically um, uh, meeting those requirements, it's very difficult to make a progress because we don't know what is the importance of other pollutants. Right. And one other question, which was from Alison, which says she's surprised to not see nitrogen dioxide and ozone in the list of pollutants. Should, should yeah, we be measuring yeah, outdoor air pollutants in indoor air more readily? Uh, I think uh, we don't have, no, we don't have that. Uh, Okay, for the tail, it's probably regarding tail. Um, we were basically very pragmatic there and try to include the pollutants that are easy to measure. And uh, for the ozone and uh, NO2, it's not easy, although there are sensors now for NO2 and probably NO2 should be uh, considered as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's the sensors that make it difficult there. Thank you ever so much, Pavel. Um, that's been really helpful. And Thank you very much. I'm hoping you'll be able to stay around for discussion, more Thank, discussion later on today. You. Okay. Let us move on now to our, our second speaker of the morning. Um, so, Corinne Mandarin, who is uh, leading the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory at the Science and Technical Centre for Building in Paris in France. Um, Corinne's been working on human exposure to chemicals and indoor environments for 17 years and her interests are around exposure and risk assessments of VOCs and particles, especially dwellings, schools and office buildings. Uh, Corinne is also um, a fellow of the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and she is currently their president. So thank you ever so much for joining us and making that in this morning to be part of our uh, session. Thank you very much, Kath. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation to join your um, your meeting today. I'm extremely happy to participate to this discussion and to speak about the monitoring of indoor air pollutants, the, the challenges. And I think my presentation is very complementary to the, the one of Pavel because we I, I will mention things that he already mentioned, but in a very compl complementary manner. So to start my presentation, just a few words about the French uh, Indoor Air Quality Observatory. Um, so this observatory was created in 2001. We are celebrating our 20 years this, this year uh, to, to develop indoor air research at a national scale uh, in France, to, to improve knowledge on indoor air quality in buildings, uh, to provide support for poli public policies, and also to provide support to the professional, the practitioners, and, and the general public. Uh, this observatory is a pub entirely publicly funded by the by three ministries, ministries in charge of housing, health and the environment, and two public health agencies, uh, the ADEM and the, the ANSES Agency for Environmental Health. So, uh, I don't manage to move. What, what are we doing in this observatory? Our main mission, our main job every day is to organize nationwide, uh, nationwide monitoring campaigns across the, the country to, to describe indoor air pollution and to understand the, the factors influencing this pollution. So, for example, you see on this map the, the schools that we instrumented during uh, our school survey in 2000, between 2013 and 2017. Uh, 600 classrooms were randomly selected across France and we did around, um, we measured around 100 parameters during a week in these classrooms. We also do specific studies to reply to specific questions for our ministries. For example, we, we assess the cost of indoor air pollution in France, every the yearly cost, and we also work, for example, on cleaning products and impact on indoor air quality in schools. And we also do a regular review of the literature, but I won't enter into details. So what is monitoring? What is IQ monitoring uh, today? What we are doing every day? We either use passive samplers, as you see on the, the picture. So the advantage is they are very small. They are not noisy. There is no pump. 
pumping, so it's easy. But the drawbacks is that uh, we, we, we cannot target all the parameters of interest. We have a very short list of, of compounds that can be measured with passive samplers. And uh, passive samplers need to be exposed during at least five or seven days or several. We need to go twice in buildings to put them and then to collect them. The, the other main method, standardized method, is active sampling. So we are using a tube on which air is pumped for a pump. So the, the advantage is that we can look at a more broader number of, uh, of substances. But the drawbacks is that it, it can be noisy in, in a classroom or in a bedroom. And, um, and it's not always easy to, to implement by, by anybody. And in both cases, the, the limita one limitation is that you don't have the results uh, immediately. You, you need to send a sample in the lab and the analysis and the results uh, are coming a few days or a few weeks later. So for me, uh, the challenge one for indoor air quality monitoring today is to make the, this monitoring easier. And how to make this easier is to, to develop online monitoring sensor, sensor system. And I think Pavel already started speaking about this. So you, you can see on this slide a few examples of things that, are, that you can be found on internet. And there are more and more uh, systems that can be, that can be bought. Uh, so this is true that they have real, um, real advantages. For example, we can imagine that a municipality is using such sensors uh, in the schools of the city and uh, is online following indoor air quality in these classrooms and on, directly can be aware of any problem in one classroom and can remediate to this indoor air quality problem very rapidly. So this is very interesting for, for the building managers. Uh, this can also be very interesting for the building users. We can, there are already some systems that use a traffic light indicator with a green light. You know, air quality is good. You don't need to do anything. But as soon as it turns to orange or to red, it means that either the van mechanical ventilation system is not functioning correctly or you, you need to, to open the window because um, indoor air is, is becoming bad. And as you were mentioning at the beginning, Kat, this can also be used for citizen science studies. And this is because they are small and easy to use. So this is, this is int an interesting, um, interesting tools. Uh, what is also interesting with such um, equipment is that we can, we can have online uh, uh, evolution of indoor air quality with the, the passive sampling or the active sampling that I was mentioning at the beginning. We only have one concentration at the end of the, the, year, the, the, the week, sorry. We have only one value. While using an online continuous measurement system, we can follow uh, indoor air quality and we can better understand what are the sources and better understand the, the respective contribution of the sources. So you can see on, on this figure with the measurement we did in a, in a, in a dwelling, in a, in a living room with different type of activities in the kitchen close to the living room. And we can see the evolution over time and what activity is the more uh, impacting on indoor air quality. And this, what is also interesting, you, you, we can follow temporal variation over a long period. Uh, and you, you see here the example of a monitoring of particles in an office, uh, an, an office, uh, an open, open, uh, open, pl open plan office uh, during several months. So this is also interesting to see if there are seasonal evolution, what can be done depending on, on the season. But the limitation today, uh, there are still some limitations to this IAQ uh, sensor system. So the, some remain very expensive. The, 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 two, the two previous uh, figures I show you were done, the measurements were done with very sophisticated tools, several, several uh, thousand euros, so not, not accessible to everybody, to every building owner or a municipality. Uh, so some, this, this is the, the cost is still a limitation and there are more and more low-cost ones, the, the one that I show you uh, on the slides that can be found on the internet. Uh, they are not all reliable. There are interferences with humidity or other gas in the air. Uh, few pollutants can be measured. This is one, one problem. And uh, Pavel was mentioning the TVOC metric. Most of the sensor can only measure TVOC. Uh, but we don't know exactly what, what is measured and there is no specific individual VOCs that, that is measured. And this is problematic because we know that specific one have, have health effects such as benzene or formaldehyde. Uh, there is no calibration, of course, contrary, uh, on the contra contrary to a device that uh, is managed by a lab and that, that is calibrated every year. And there may be drift over time. 
So I show you on the on the right part of the slide some measurement that we did in um, in the climate chambers in our lab. So we we exposed uh, different uh, uh, low cost sensor systems, IAQ sensors, and we we injected known concentration of PM two point five at two levels, uh, two thousand and five hundred microgram per meter per cubic meter and 4,000 microgram per cubic meter. And the, 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 to the dark line uh, is the one done with uh, the, is the results, the concentration measured with a, a reference device. Uh, and the, the blue, orange, and the green line are the results given by the sensors. And you see that even one uh, device is not look, is not <laughs> realizing, it's not measuring any particles while we are sending some, some PM 2.5 from, from incense. Maybe I forgot to tell. So. This is not, not always reliable. And another example, we, this was the same uh, sensor systems that were exposed to CO2 at three levels uh, in the climate, uh, in the experimental chamber. So here, the, the blue dark line is the, the one measured with a, a calibrated standardized device. And you see, on the contrary, the particles were underestimated. Here, for CO2, the concentration are overestimated. And we have even uh, concentration going to above uh, 10,000 ppm, that is totally impossible in, in indoor air, in, in common indoor environments. So these are interesting tools, but be careful when you have to choose one to, to do measurement, because today this, they are not all, uh, all reliable. And the challenge to identify is to, to identify the key components. So key meaning uh, having relation with else and that for which we we need that that we need to follow that we need to monitor because they they may have else uh, impacts. So this is not an, an easy question. So um, because we, what what we observed is that pollution indoor air pollution is evolving over time. And I show you on this slide the median concentration that we measured that we have been measuring uh, over the past twenty years in dwellings and school. And the, so the, the dark blue bars are showing the median. Uh, concentration measured in dwellings in 2001, then in dwellings a bit later, the, the, the light blue, then the gray in dwellings in between 2013 and 14, and the green bars are the measurement on in schools. And you see that over time, the concentration are decreasing. Uh, uh, these are concentration of um, organic solvents, and we know that they are, because of the health effect, the, the, the producer are reducing their concentration in products. So concentration are decreasing over time, and it, now the chlorinated compounds, they cannot be detected anymore in buildings, at, at least in the measurement that we are doing. So. So it's good, it's good news. People, uh, some substances are, are di disappearing, but we have new ones, new uses. There are new products in buildings and they may uh, emit uh, new substances. For example, uh, we have the fluor compact lamps that may emit mercury. Vaping is a new, a new activity, recent activity that also emits uh, new, uh, other VOCs. And uh, 3D printing, so maybe it's not so common in dwellings, but 3D printing is really developing and 3D 3D printing is also emitting some compounds in indoor air. So what are these compounds? And we need to focus on them. And uh, another thing that I find very interesting to, to see the evolution of indoor air pollution is the, the results from the German environmental survey. They're, in Germany, they are performing a nationwide survey in dwellings since the beginning of the 90s, so a long time ago. And they are, froze, they are frozing their samples. So the, Recently, they reanalyzed all samples that were that were frozen from old studies, and they they looked specifically to two plasticizers, the DINGE and DEHT. And you see, and so it was in settled dust. So you, we clearly see there is a rising, increasing concentration over time because these two substances are new. They are substituting old phthalates, and so now we people are exposed to these substances in their in, in buildings. So I, I briefly introduce you two, two, two things we are doing at the observatory to identify the, the key substances, the key pollutants. Uh, we are doing regular regulatory, what we are calling um, IAQ ranking, health ranking uh, uh, exercise. It means that we are looking in the literature, all the substances that have already been measured in indoor air, so measured in indoor air or in settled dust, um, or measured at the emission of building material or consumer products, or that we know that are present in content of product at, and that can evaporate. So once we have this long list of substances, we looked at the hazard 
from all these substances based on hazard classification done by national or international agencies. So the last health ranking of indoor air pollutants we did in 2018, we identify uh, 2,741 substances. And among them, 206 were identified as priority because of the, their um, hazard classification. So a, a huge amount of, of substances that are of potential health interest. And the second things approach we're using is also reanalyzing chromatograms. So chromatogram is what we obtain um, from, from a lab when we are doing an analysis. And today, when we are looking at substances, we are specifically looking at one, as you see, compound substance A, B, C, D, and we are blind with the other substance. We are, we are looking at for what we are, we are just analyzing what we are looking for, but there may be other substances, as you see with the, the red, uh, the red circles. So we try to reanalyze some chromatograms from a past study and only in 10 chromatograms that was um, from dwellings, dwellings measurements, we identify 306 and, five, and 56 substances uh, identified with certainty. So such uh, analysis are done automatically with a software developed by, by NIST. So I won't enter into the details of all these substances, but uh, what is rising is in, in indoor air, what we see is siloxanes are more and more uh, used and terpenes more and more used in link with uh, air freshener perfumes in, in buildings. And what is new also, but I will not enter into details because we don't have time and I'm not a specialist of this, is the what is called the NTA, the non-target analysis. So this is a new technique that instead of looking specifically at compounds A, B, C, or D, we, are, we don't know what we are looking for. And these techniques makes it possible to, to collect all the substances that are in the sample. So this is very, very interesting. And uh, such first analysis have been carried out in the frame of the EU Norman network. And once again, a large number of substances have been identified, more than uh, 2,000 um, with this uh, NTA non-target analysis technique. So maybe you are lost with all what I mentioned about all these substances. So uh, as Pavel was mentioning, we can be pragmatic and for the moment look at WHO recommendation. So in 2010, WHO published uh, the first indoor air quality guidelines for nine, uh, nine compounds. So it can be a le short list to, to be considered for to, to measure in buildings. And uh, more recently, uh, earlier this year in March, WHO also published a review on the chemical pollutants uh, of interest in, in public buildings with children, uh, because WHO is developing an online tool to, to do risk assessment associated to indoor air pollution in buildings with children. So they identify some uh, health effects of cancer, of concern, such as cancer or effects on development, and uh, identify a short list of priority chemicals uh, to be measured in, in, in buildings where there are children. So this can also be a list to be considered if you, if you have to do measurements in buildings. So to conclude, we have, uh, the two, we have two challenges. Uh, first, technical challenges, because we, we need to create these new devices that will make it easy to do, to do indoor air quality monitoring. As today, there are a large monitoring system for outdoor air. Uh, it's really much more complicated for indoor air, but we need to have these tools to be able to assess uh, indoor air quality. And this is an opportunity for innovation and also for business and economic development in, in our countries. And there are also research challenges. We really need to better understand uh, the pollutants for, that are associated to health effects uh, so that the policymakers, the practitioner really target and refocus on these pollutants and reduce uh, Expo human exposure in buildings to, to these pollutants. So I thank you again very much for your attention and for this invitation today. That was fantastic, Corinne. Thank you ever so much for your um, presentation. Um, really interesting there. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. So um, let me find them in the chat because the chat likes to move around. <laughs> um, so I think we've got a question from Jim, which says that he, he thinks there have been some research projects that have benchmark sensors. But is there actually an unmet need for standards for low cost sensors or a proper program to evaluate different sensor products and rate them on an ongoing basis for researchers and building managers? 
If some, I know that our sensors for outdoor air pollutants, uh, there is a standard being established at a EU level, at a, a SEN level, uh, standard is in preparation, but for indoor air quality, I don't know any initiative to, to set some standards to assess these devices, but this is the, for me the key point. We need such a standard so that every new equipment, every new device on the market should be tested according to these standards and then uh, having a proof of a uh, saying, okay, you can use it, it's, it's, it's reliable, it's not uh, drifting over time, and it's not in interference with humidity. Or we, 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 would, we should have such a, a label, so a standard behind, behind the label. I thought it was really interesting you showed that CO2 data because you know everybody's using CO2 sensors at the moment, and some of them clearly are not going to give you anything close to what is a reasonable estimate. Exactly, exactly. Some CO2, we observe that some CO2 device are, measure, are measuring VOC, TVOC first, and then are doing a multiplication to assess CO2. That's why they are giving very high and impossible value of CO2 concentration over 10,000 ppm. So, yeah, as you say, Kath, at the moment where people are using more and more CO2 uh, sensors in building against the pandemic, this is important to, to, to be sure to use a reliable uh, device. And I've got a question from Noel, which says, can you arrive at a standard indoor environment when, for example, in residential environments, we have such wide ranging building stock that vary in age, building materials and occupancy? Yes, it's true that uh, each indoor environment is unique. <laughs> this is what it makes difficult to, to measure. But um, a standard at WHO, I think we should use, if it's your question, WHO standards uh, account for all situations and also account for sensitive, sensible people. So this, this should be used uh, in buildings. Can I ask, as well, I mean, you, you've highlighted that you know, you're doing an observatory, so you measure on a regular basis. And you mentioned that Germany also measuring on a regular basis. Do you think this is a value? I, I mean, I'm sure there is, but you know, the value in doing that long term regular measurement. Um, I think yes, because it helps really the, the policy makers. For, for example, in France, our measurement helped the, the ministries to set a, a mandatory labeling of VOC emission by building materials. So now, since a few years, it's mandatory when you buy a glue or a carpet or paints, you have a label from A plus low emission to C higher emission. So this label was created by the, the policy makers because they're on the basis of the most common VOCs that we measured in dwellings. So yes, and they, this, this help a lot. And this also help our, our baseline value or help in case of a specific event. You know, when the, the cathedral Notre Dame burnt, uh, there was a huge pollution around in schools and daycare centers and measurements were done. So with our data, uh, the municipality was able to, to, to see if there was exceedance or if it was just the baseline. So it was very useful to identify the, the schools that were polluted because they were the measurement were the concentration were much higher that what we found regularly commonly in schools. So this gives a baseline that is useful, I, I think, for policymakers, but for anybody. That's really interesting. Thank you ever so much for that. So yeah, thank you for um, a really good talk there, Corinne. And um, I think we've really set the scene well for some discussion today. So our, our next speaker today is Ben Barrett. Ben is a reader in environmental exposures and public health. Um, and he's Deputy Director of the Environmental Research Group at Imperial College in London. Um, Ben's been involved with many initiatives around air quality, including the London Air Quality Network, London Congestion, Charging Zone, Low Emission Zone. And he's developed analysis methods to characterise sources, trends and behaviour in urban air pollution. And more recently has focused on studies to improve resolution of environmental exposure assessments for large scale population studies. Um, and allowing the public to make informed choices about their own exposure to both indoor and outdoor air pollution. So um, you can get your slides to, to show the right screen then. <laughs> correct, correct slides. Correct. That's the important bit. Right. <laughs> uh, so can you see my presentation or my notes? Oh, it's showing up as the, um, the notes one at the moment. So I want the other display. That better? Uh, yep, that's perfect. Uh, whenever you're ready, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. Um, so, um, 
Yes, nicely designed uh, set of presentations today because my talk really follows on quite nicely from um, Pebbles and Kareen's uh, from a slightly different perspective. Uh, and I'm looking at uh, some of the challenges and lessons we might learn in translating ambient air quality metrics uh, to indoor environments, uh, particularly to inform health practice and policy, i.e. ultimately to protect the health of populations. And this is particularly well timed because the WHO will be releasing the update of their ambient air quality guidelines this afternoon at two o'clock, I think, which is long awaited. So many of those ambient guidelines and standards across the world are based on a methodology which involves collating evidence from many, many uh, studies around the world that link um, exposure to air pollution to health impacts. And this is the typical methodology used, use an example from London. So that's a high resolution model of ambient air quality in London, which is used to assess the exposure of an individual living in a particular location. And then that is linked with some other health uh, data and administrative data to link uh, this exposure level to a health impact for a particular pollutant. So that's how ambient, ambient air quality standards are, are typically estimated. However, um, as has been shown um, by Jim at the beginning of today, it's much more complex. And this is basically my version of, of Jim's brainstorming where the, what we actually breathe is a big mixture of how we behave and how we move around a space. There are both indoor sources and outdoor sources. The outdoor sources infiltrate into our buildings. The indoor sources ventilate out of our buildings. The rate and nature of that uh, exchange is dictated by uh, the building itself, how old it is, what materials it's made of, etc., and its location as well, and how the residents within that building behave. We don't just spend all our time at home, although we do spend a significant time there. We go to school, we go to work, and we travel in between. Each one of these different microenvironments will have different characteristics, different air quality, uh, and different ways of, of calculating what's going on. So this is really complex. And then when you bring health into it, you've also got to consider the age, uh, the sensitivity, and even in some cases, the ethnicity of, of the people that you're trying to protect and vulnerability uh, to air pollution can take many different forms, uh, whether that's to do with existing health conditions um, or whether it's to do with particular age groups or even things like choice and social economic status. So if we really want to protect health, we've got to look at the, these different things and see whether uh, air pollution affects parts of the population disproportionately. And it's also been mentioned by, by several others that we've got to look at both acute effects and chronic effects uh, on health impacts. And then of course, there's quality of life as well, which I guess could be called one of those comfort measurements, but quality of life can be the difference between debilitation and a good quality of life. So that's extremely important. I'm mostly now going to be concentrating on the residential side of things because that's where most of us spend most of our time, particularly those most vulnerable people. So what I'm going to present is a series of challenges, which is a bit depressing. I really should be, be balancing out my challenges and opportunities, but I've not managed to do that because this is a very challenging field. And it's really just discussion points from uh, thoughts that I've had, studies that we've done, etc. It's not presentation of, of, of results of studies. It's more uh, highlight points to think about. And the first one is quite important and not really discussed very much, but, in, but when you're thinking about translation from ambient to indoors is, is key. So as I've said, this is the, amp, the evidence for ambient standards is largely based on epidemiological evidence using ecological models, i.e. what is air quality outside like and how can this be linked to health? Therefore, those ambient metrics are actually a proxy for human exposure. What those studies show that living in a location that experiences air quality, ambient air quality of X, results in Y elevated risk of harm. They're not saying someone breathing air quality levels of X results in Y level of harm because their metrics are based on ambient or outdoor air quality. So an ambient metric of 10, 
10 micrograms is not the same as an indoor metric of 10 micrograms in health standard terms. They can be quite different. I'll come on to physical and chemical reasons why they're different, but in purely in terms of metrics, they're not necessarily the same. One is a proxy for what people breathe. The other one is an actual what people breathe. So the difference between slides one and two. A little bit subtle, but potentially quite important. Second challenge. If we're trying to learn from ambient air quality standards, a really key point is that WHA starts with guidelines. These get translated into air quality standards, then the standards that get translated into legislation and management regime. The air quality, ambient air quality management regime has traditionally very much been an environmental regime, i.e. air quality in the environment is assessed and areas that are found to be below those standards, efforts are taken to improve them. And again, a little zoom in on the model on the left, those areas of most air quality have got some really quite low levels of resident population density, whereas some of the uh, better air quality areas have got very high population density. But the current air quality management regime, based on those metrics, will concentrate on the worst areas, not the most harmful areas. Similarly, the way we might measure ambient air quality is based very often on the worst areas, not the most harmful areas. And you can see on the right there some dots of local authority owned and established monitoring sites and most of them are little cars. So most of those monitoring sites will be in areas of exceedance, which are next to major roads. Most people don't live next to major roads, even in a big city like London. So those standards have driven a regime which is based on the environment, not based on health protection. And I think this is a mistake that's being realised, but it's, it's a challenge that we should uh, recognise when we're moving forward in other areas. Challenge three. So, so what is harmful? And this has been touched on already as well, so I'll skim over it. But we've got a lot of evidence. We've got a huge amount of evidence of the harm of ambient air quality. Indoor air quality is different. We've got different sources, we've got different pollutants and different mixtures of those pollutants. They're really quite different, but uh, is there knowledge we can translate? Can we use that huge amounts of evidence? And in fact, the WHO indoor air quality guidance did use uh, evidence from our outdoor epidemiological studies in, in assessing those standards. These two ch charts on the bottom are from a very large personal exposure monitoring campaign we did with COPD patients. And it looks at, uh, uh, odds ratios or, or risks, elevated risks above or below one of respiratory symptoms in those 130 patients that we tracked for six months. Now, the key point here is we've split what they're exposed to from our measurements to personal exposure to PM 2.5 on the left, CO on the right, total personal exposure, personal exposure to indoor sources of pollution, personal exposure to outdoor sources of air pollution and the ambient proxy, i.e. The, the outdoor fixed monitoring site. And what we find is these, these four metrics are different. When we relate them to the health of those patients, we get different results. We get different odds ratios. So this indicates that one, there are different metrics, different mixtures of pollutants in these different exposure metrics, but also that using one as an indicator to another can induce uh, quite significant uncertainty and measurement error in some cases. So we've got to be a bit careful when we translate evidence from one domain to another. How long is harmful? So acute can mean all sorts of things. Typically acute in health terms is, is around a 24 hour exposure because that's, that's limited on what we can gather the data for, particularly in health terms. It's very difficult to measure a health metric in, in anything higher time resolution than 24 hours. But particularly indoors, we get some very uh, short and sharp exposures. This is from another study with uh, personal exposure monitors with PM 2.5. The bluish line is exposure that person breathed from outdoor source of pollution, the red is from indoor. And these are all measurements, by the way, none of these are models. And you can see that the blue line sort of trundles up and down, We've got some days more ele elevated than others. You get sort of smaller peaks during the morning rush hour and, and troughs overnight approximately. 
the red line is much more spiky. And particularly you can see that this particular person typically cooked in the morning, but not in the afternoon, except on Saturday when they had a couple of meals by the look of it and a big Sunday lunch fairly early on the Sunday. These are much shorter, much sharper peaks. In health terms, how important is that? Do we need to go down to one hour, 15 minutes, even one minute? It's very difficult to identify whether these short, sharp periods of exposure are important or not. And we need to know that when we set the metrics. Who's responsible? Oh, I think I think this is really interesting state that we're in at the moment. To, um, up until now, the indoor and the outdoor air quality fields have been really quite separate. And that there is some good reasons for that, but there are also many bad reasons for that. And I think we're beginning to fix that. And discussions like today's really demonstrate that. And the reason being, of course, outdoor air quality affects indoor air quality to quite a significant degree. This is a study we did for DEFRA. The blue line is uh, nitrogen dioxide concentrations as measured by one of the network, DEFRA network sites. The gray line is uh, an O2 monitor positioned on the facade of the building, this particular building where this resident lived. And you can see the two track each other quite nicely. There's some variation because they're not in exactly the same place, but pretty much the two outdoor monitors track each other quite well. The orange is a monitor placed inside that home. And you can see when the outdoor concentrations go up, the indoor concentrations go up. When they go down, they go down. Two reasons for this. One is infiltration of outdoor sources are dominant in this particular uh, local residence. Two, the very, very few indoor sources of NO2 in this house. They don't use gas for heating or cooking. Uh, there's no, no source to it deviate. So all of those in all of that indoor exposure to nitrogen dioxide is from outdoor sources. And that is purely dictated by the infiltration rate, which might be the building design, it might be window opening habits, etc. The yellow line is their personal exposure. When they're at home, the yellow line and the orange line match because their monitors are more or less but next door to each other. During the day, they're in the office in an office environment in central London, and air quality is much cleaner in that mechanically ventilated environment. And the big spikes at the beginning and the end of the day are their commute, and they get much higher exposure to traffic related pollution. So these are all linked and they're all influencing each other. So where does the metric stand? Who's responsible for meeting that metric? Is it the outdoor polluters? Is it the indoor polluters? Is it the building design people, etc.? So these, this is why I think it's important that indoor and outdoor people need to talk together more. Following on to that, how do you assess it? And Corrine mentioned this several times, um, as did um, Pavel. Are we going to move towards a system that's measured in the real world, in laboratory or theoretical uh, by modeling methods? If we're looking at health protection, we really do need to have a direct link between exposure, what people breathe and their health. This is evidence-based health metrics and it's absolutely essential. So laboratory tests can provide supporting mechanistic evidence, but ultimately can't really be used to provide the evidence, robust evidence that we need. And to do that, those metrics need to be practical and measurable. It's no good for setting a standard that we simply can't measure. And if we're gonna do that, we need access to private spaces. Uh, Kareem talked about miniaturization sensors, and I totally agree. They have lots of data challenges. Uh, people need to understand this, and I could talk for a whole 20 minutes on that. Human behavior indoors is a disproportionately large influence compared to outdoors. Outdoors, it's mostly a mass of people behaving in a certain way that produces air quality. In indoors, it can be an individual behaving in a certain way. And of course, we're all different, so how do you scale this up? And then we've got to think about ethics. How do you present results which are very personal to someone's behavior? And I've got a couple of examples of that in the next slide. So this is to, uh, slide, to results from monitoring of school children, personal monitoring of school children. Principally, this was to look at the commute to school and air quality at school, but we also measured it where parents agreed at home air quality as well. So on the left, we've got, uh, a trace over five days for PM 2.5 uh, in one particular home that measured continuously. 
And yes, you can see the school commutes. You can see the elevated PM 2.5 when that child traveled to and from school in the morning, in the afternoon. Fortunately, the school's air quality is pretty good. But at home, we've got levels over 450 micrograms of PM 2.5 with a slow decay. That's clearly dinner being cooked on each of those days and a pretty low ventilation rate in that house to have that decay curve. These absolutely dwarf those ambient PM 2.5 concentrations. The one on the right, don't know if anyone wants to guess what's going on there, but that's a kid going home and the parent smoking in the house. I presume it's not the primary school child smoking in the house. Again, 450 concentrations, so same sort of level as, as the cooking, but regular peaks. There's a lot of cigarettes being smoked in that household. Who's responsible for that? How do we deal with that? That's clearly got terrible indoor air quality, but it's not something that anyone other than that householder can deal with. So seven challenges. I felt obliged to put up some opportunities to try and counter that. Um, toxicology can be tremendously useful in health terms. I've mostly talked about epidemiological evidence. Uh, we can really use in both in vitro and vivo tox work to look at different sources and the health impacts in those um, in a mechanistic way. We shouldn't strive for perfection. What we know is uh, many of these pollutants, we already know they're harmful to health and there are no safe level. So we've got to get air quality as good as possible. Will a metric distract from that or will it help with that? We need something with best air quality we can achieve. We've done a lot of observing. We really need to focus on intervention as well. This is a, a problem that the ambient world has struggled with. Thousands of study observing the health impacts of air pollution. Very few studies looking at the health benefits of intervention. The public is more engaged than ever on this issue, really high level of interest, but you've got to give them empowerment. You've got to give them solutions and control, otherwise they'll just feel helpless and disengage. And finally, there's been three really great wave two projects as the Strategic Priorities Fund set together, which is another factor of how this network is funded as well. So I should add, and the SPF networks, are a big step forward uh, and we really should use them. There's some great field work being going on around TOX, uh, individual behaviours, NTAs mentioned by uh, Corrine Microplastics, which is not mentioned yet, Biometric PM, etc. So I'll finish then, just to thank uh, lots and lots of people who worked with us and all of the participants. Many thanks, Ben. That was really interesting. And uh, anyone I think we've planned this because all of these talks keep following on from each other beautifully. Um, so there is a, a question in the chat um, from Alison. She says it's a bit of a devil's advocate question. If air quality metrics for exposure across many different microenvironments are so complex and difficult to monitor against, is it perhaps better to focus on emission standards and reducing those as far as possible? After all, in the end, air quality targets are mainly a means to drive emission standards reductions anyway. I, I would agree with that to a point. Um, I think we know, need to know how to prioritise prioritize those emissions reductions. Um, I think we need to, and I guess there's very similar parallels with climate here, um, because there's no di little direct health impact from climate emissions, we're focusing on emissions there as well. Um, but then you get into this personal behavioural aspect. So um, I think it's been interesting that the route that gas cookers, gas heating is going down for climate reasons, it looks like we're going to be banning those in new developments going forward, hopefully. Uh, but that should also have a very big benefit impact, beneficial impact on indoor air quality. Do we then ban them in everyone else's homes? Because that's only new builds. So what do we do about that legacy that I think Pavel mentioned? Uh, I think that's trickier, particularly in people's homes where something is already there. Do we take it away from them? I agree. I think that's a difficult one. And for example, things like um, wood burning stoves. What do you do that? They've, they've, they've increased. Do you take them away? Yeah, probably well, should. But <laughs> <laughs> probably shouldn't have let that one happen, should we? <laughs> yeah, but it's tricky. Very tricky. Um, I was also interested. I mean, you, you showed some really nice data showing some of that variability and different exposures. So, you know, how, how many people do we think we have to go and sort of follow before we get a feel for the 
the level of the, the exposures that will give us data to make health decisions yeah really really difficult we've tried doing behavior modeling on our 130 cohort because we had six months of personal data with them we could look at how their behavior varied from day to day week to week season to season and what we found is that some people are really predictable and we can predict what their exposures will be in future times just by using ambient air pollution air levels we know what they they live we know what their rate is, filtration rate is we know how often they cook etc great we can do those others just hopeless You're totally unpredictable so i guess we might want to look at the particular the most vulnerable and start there and really try and focus on them and their behavior and, and, and really help that section yeah really interesting um one last question which has come from jim it said ben do you have any thoughts on defra's outdoor daily air quality index and associated health advice and whether this kind of approach to banding public advice is transferable to indoor environments uh, that's, that's kind of what i was getting at around perfection isn't necessary what's good enough to inform and protect we we find it very difficult all of our participants that we work with they're giving up their time and their space and we have to feed back to them and in many cases, we can't put a line on a graph saying on Tuesday, your air quality was was harmful on Wednesday, it was not harmful because it's relative and we don't have many of those metrics. But they want to know that they always ask that, is this harmful or not? Um, so we have to use different method, methods like comparison. Well, you were you were in the top 25 percentile of the cleanest people or <laughs> something like that. So I think we, we do need something that is indicative, but we need to look to communicators and public information specialists to try and get across messages which are sufficiently targeted to be useful, but sufficiently broad to stop people over-interpreting their meaning. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I think we see quite a lot of that at the moment around COVID and ventilation, that mm. there's a almost an obsession in some places with the particular value of CO2 in a space. And yet it's just one indicative measure yeah. of, of potential risk. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben, um, for a really interesting talk. So we will move on to our um, final speaker of the morning. Um, so Amy Stidworthy is going to talk next. Amy uh, studied maths at Cambridge and a master's in meteorology at Reading um, and worked a bit at the Met Office before she joined in Cambridge Environmental Research Consultants or CERIC as an ADMS model developer. She's been there um, about 20 years now and um, she's now a principal consultant uh, and a lot of her work is focused on air quality forecasting, model evaluation and stakeholder user engagement. So she's leading two aspects of the MAQS health project, development of a, a health verification system and stakeholder engagement to the project. So i um, really pleased to have you this morning, Amy, and um, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, thank you for the invitation to speak at today's meeting. Um, yes. Really interesting morning. Um, as an outdoor air quality modeler, it's, um, sorry, make this, turn this into a slideshow. Okay. Uh, yeah, as an outdoor um, air quality modeler, it's really interesting to hear the challenges around indoor air quality modeling and the challenges that that poses for outdoor air quality modeling, I think. Um, because as the link between air pollution and poor health becomes much clearer, um, there is, of course, an increasing need for high quality, consistent ambient air pollution data that we can use in health research in all parts of towns and cities where people um, live and work, as Ben said. Um, and while measurements provide an important source of data, they often lack the spatial and temporal coverage or resolution that health researchers need. Um, and regional air quality models are essential tools for modeling the dispersion of pollution over large distances but these are driven and these are driven by spatially and temporally varying meteorological output from mesoscale models and they can model complex deposition and chemical processes that occur over a large range of temporal and spatial scales and sometimes these models are applied at relatively high resolution in urban areas but even then they're not able to resolve the large concentration gradients that you get 
for instance, um, close to roads in urban areas. These are locations where air pollution concentrations might be highest. So for a complete picture for health research, you need an alternative modelling approach. On the other hand, local Gaussian plume models um, in use a lot in the UK, they are able to resolve, resolve the detailed concentrations within an urban area because they explicitly represent the near field features of the dispersion of emissions from all source types like point sources, line, area, volume, road, and even airport runway sources can be modelled. But the most widely used models of this type, like CERC's ADMS model or the US EPA's AirMod model, are they're not applicable over large distances because they're limited by their use of stationary and usually spatially homogeneous meteorology. Also, Gaussian plume models aren't suitable for modelling the stagnation of emissions that you get at low wind speeds. So, the aim of the Max Health project is to develop a system to account for the full range of temporal and spatial scales by coupling local and regional models to produce a system that will be capable of providing the high quality, consistent air pollution data that health researchers need. So today, I'm gonna to tell you about the project. I'm gonna tell you about the system we're developing and the output the system will be able to produce and about how the project is progressing. So Max Health is funded under the Clean Air Programme of the Strategic Priorities Fund. The project team is led by CERC and brings together our experts in software development and application of local dispersion models with regional modelling experts from the universities of Birmingham, Edinburgh, Hertfordshire and Lancaster. And the team are also working very closely with the Met Office. So the system we're producing is flexible. It links the most advanced regional chemical transport models that are available like CMAC, EMET and WARFCHEM with a new street scale model called ADMS Local and with CERC's widely used ADMS Urban Model. ADMS Local is quick to run and it can reproduce the sharp gradients of pollution seen at street level in urban areas. It also accounts for the impact that complex urban morphology has on pollution dispersion, like lower winds and increased turbulence in built up areas and the trapping of air pollution in street canyons. The systems verification module enables validation of predictions against roadside measurements, which is not possible with the standalone grid-based regional models. And the coupled system and ADMS local will be available to the UK research community for air quality and health, and will have an open structure facilitating system development and modification. So, that was an overview of the project as a whole and now I'm just going to go a bit deeper into the motivation for developing the system and some of the concepts behind it. So regional and local models as I've already said have complementary strengths so if we can successfully couple them together then the result should be a system that has all the advantages of a regional model, large scales, detailed meteorology, representation of stagnant conditions and complex chemical and deposition processes with the high resolution output of a local model so that we can predict concentrations consistently and accurately at all site types everywhere, including roadside and curbside receptors. The evaluation of the results against measured data will be very important, um, as will comparing the results of the standalone regional model with coupled system results. So when you're modeling using a grid-based regional model, it's important to include all emissions. Otherwise, the chemical and deposition processes won't be modeled correctly. But then if nesting is treated as adding concentrations of a local model directly onto a regional one, then this is double counting emissions. So our aim has been to nest the local model within the regional one without double counting. So how have we done it? Well, we define a local urban domain over which we explicitly model a range of sources over a short time period, Delta T. Then, in order to nest this model output within the regional model, we need to subtract the concentration contribution these sources make to the regional model. Ideally, we would subtract the regional model delta T concentrations away from the full regional model solution, but this would require changing the regional model code. So we've approximated the dispersion of the gridded locally modeled emissions by modeling them in ADMS local.
the, so the local steady state Gaussian plume models, they usually allow plumes to disperse for more than an hour, sort of assuming that conditions um, persist forever. Um, and that's fine if your uh, variation in meteorology and emissions is relatively slow from hour to hour. But when we're coupling a local model to a regional model, we need to make sure that the locally, model emission, locally modeled emissions are truncated at the correct time so that you separate the regional and the local influences. Essentially, we're using ADMS local for modeling the short time spatial scales where there are high concentration gradients. And then beyond those scales, the regional model gives the best results. So an essential component of any application of the system is going to be validation of concentration outputs from both the regional model and the coupled system against in situ observed data. So Max Health has been designed to include a verification system to do exactly that. The Max Health VS has been designed to provide an automated, standardized method of comparing Max Health coupled system output with in situ observed data. It's compatible with all the model data formats that are compatible with the coupled system. It's easy to access online measured data for the UK regulatory networks, and it's straightforward to compare results from different models, and the outputs are a wide range of statistics and graphs. Underneath, the system is using the popular and powerful statistical package R and the open air tools developed by David Carslaw. The system also comes, the verification system comes with a, a graphical user interface for Windows users, but the verification system itself runs on both Windows and Linux. The coupled system runs on Linux. So all the components of Max Health come together to make a system capable of delivering high resolution air pollution data for the whole country, as shown in these example maps. The local model component in Max Health captures the fine details of dispersion, fast chemistry, and the effect of street canyons. The regional model component can be any one of a range of widely used regional models, as I've already said. And there's also a generic regional model input format. So any regional model can be used if the data can be reformatted appropriately. The coupled system then couples the local and regional models together in the way that I've already described. Results at monitoring stations can feed into the verification system for comparison with measured data. And then there's typically a process of iteratively refining the model input data to improve the verification results. And finally, the coupled system produces the hourly resolution, high resolution concentration output. That's the main product of the system. So the key facts about the Max Health system are that it produces hourly concentrations at a wide range of spatial scales from a few metres up to hundreds of kilometres in that CDF format. It's compatible with current versions of many regional scale models, typically in use at UK research institutions. So WARFCHEM, CMAC, CAMEX, SHUMAR, EMEP, and plus a, a gen there's a generic regional model input format that allows coupling with other models, for example, the Met Office's ACAM model. Max Health will equip air quality modellers in research roles to produce data for the whole UK at high resolution, so down to a few metres, for health research. And it includes an integrated tool for verification of results against measured levels. So following successful alpha testing at the beginning of this year, right now beta testing is being carried out by modelling groups at the Met Office, and our project partners at universities of Birmingham, Edinburgh, Hertfordshire and Lancaster. So each modelling group is modelling a different part of the UK and mostly they're using different regional models. All the groups are running the Max Health beta version on their own systems to, provide, to produce high resolution street scale output within their domain. So the group at Lancaster University led by Oliver Wilde are looking at Northern Ireland using, using regional models results from Wolfchem. The Met Office group, led by Rachel McInnes, are modelling Southwest England using results from Ackham. The Edinburgh group, are, um, led by Ruth Doherty, are looking at all of Scotland using results from EMEP. The Birmingham group, led by Bill Bloss, are looking at the West Midlands area using results from CMAC. And the group at the University of Hertfordshire, led by Ranjit Soki, are looking at the Portsmouth and Southampton area, also using CMAC regional model results. I should add a caveat that these domains are not completely finalised. 
So we started the project back at the beginning of 2020, and so far we are progressing to schedule. We held a first stakeholder workshop in March 2020 to gather user requirements, hastily rearranged from an in-person workshop in Birmingham to an online workshop with about a week's notice due to COVID, which is not how we would have preferred to run the workshop, but it was effective and provided the information we needed to carry out the initial system design and development. And in June this year, we held the second workshop, a training workshop for beta testers to coincide with the release of the beta system. We have a third workshop with the beta testers planned for mid-October to gather their feedback on running the system. And then in response to that feedback, we'll be doing the final system refinements over the last few months of the project. And then we'll have a final launch workshop in early 2022 to coincide with the system release, hopefully in person. So thank you for listening. I appreciate that was quite a different uh, talk to the previous topics, but uh, that has been mentioned before, the outdoor air quality. Uh, is, is very important when you're thinking about indoor air quality. So I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if you want more information about the Max Health project, or if you'd like to receive occasional project update emails, again, we won't bombard you with lots of emails, just send me an email here. Um, and that will include um, information about the system launch workshop in early 2022. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay, many thanks, Amy. That was really interesting. And it sounds like it might be a really fascinating tool that we could use to, you know, start to think about modelling these, these varying, varying exposures um, and then also think about how we can couple such models to indoor mm -hmm. uh, models. So, because you know, I think it could provide the, the outdoor boundary conditions that we need for some of those indoor models. So really interesting. Uh, we've got a question from Kayla. She says, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, I'm curious as to whether MAQS Health or any other of your modelling efforts incorporate participatory methodological approaches such as community modelling to account for lived experience and local knowledge that could illuminate failures of the model at the local level. So, so same thinking of analogous work on flood risk with the Environment Agency. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, most of our um, sort of analysis of whether the model's succeeding or not is, is based on measurements. So, um, you know, and looking at, and looking at whether, how the model performs against measurements, but looking at how it performs against um, people's experience of air quality, no, that's not something we've done, um, but it's an interesting idea about uh, people's perception of air quality, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that possibly goes back to what Ben said earlier about we mm. measure the environment, but we don't necessarily focus on the spaces which are most impactful for health. Um, but I, I guess actually your model will allow us to to certainly look at those exposures into di in different places and relate it to where people live. But certainly, I think the, the, the getting that high resolution data is key when you're looking at um, particularly, I mean, health studies are often looking at health data on a postcode basis and getting the, the measurements down to that that level of resolution um, in a consistent way over large areas is, is, is really important for that. Yeah. Uh, and Malcolm said just picking up on the point I said do you think it's possible that we'll be able to transfer data directly from MAQS to a, say a boundary condition for an indoor airflow modelling or would we need to think about an intermediary step? No. I guess the question is on how the indoor air quality modelling is being done and what, what quantities you need uh, you need for your boundary conditions, because what we're producing in, in Max Health are concentrations of, of particular species. So if, if those species, well, if, if that's what you need for your indoor air quality modelling, once, you, once the, the metrics and the important um, things that need to be assessed for indoor air quality have been decided, then then, then, then no, I, well, yes, yeah, so I guess it depends. So potentially it would out, you can output transient pollutant concentrations. And do you also output the, the weather conditions at the time at that same point? So the weather conditions come from the regional model. Yeah. Um, so that information is available. Uh, and yeah, yes, I, and, yeah, so I guess we are, we are outputting actually the meteorology that's used for each, for each individual hour. This is hourly modelling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. I suspect we might be having a further conversation <laughs> about this. So yeah, fascinating. Um, okay, I would like to say um, thank you, Amy, and thank you to 
all of our four speakers this morning for for really interesting, quite different presentations. But I think thinking us through the complexities of of measuring, modelling and understanding both indoor and urban air quality and the fact that they're connected together. So what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to do an offline session, well, an online offline session, if that makes sense. So rather than on Zoom, we will open a Padlet. I think Helen will put the link. She's just put it in the, in the chat. So in the chat, there are two links. There is a Padlet link where we would like people to think about everything they've heard, think about all of their experiences and start to put some comments, questions, key points, discussion into the Padlet so we can um, pick up sort of key th thoughts that people are doing. It's th think of it as like a post-it note session. Um, and then at the same time, we also have put a link to the systems map that um, Jim mentioned in the very first talk. Um, which um, is the more detailed map, but you can have a look at that and look at the sort of thinking we've got in there. And perhaps, you know, some of the questions we've had there is we know that there are all these connections, that these influences of, you know, different parameters on each other, but and we know that we have some data for some of them. So we know that there's probably quite a lot of data on uh, the impact of temperature on thermal comfort. But then there are other aspects where we either are lacking data or we need to talk to different communities for that data to come together. Uh, my name's Malcolm Cook, uh, Loughborough University, and I'm, um, I'm one of the co-leads for Theme 1 of this network. I'm coupled indoor and outdoor environments, so I've been particularly interested to, to hear all the elements of the presentations this morning regarding how we might how we might uh, go about more accurately representing those those exchanges. So we've got a panel discussion now for the next uh, for the next half an hour, and um, we welcome back uh, three of our speakers. So uh, uh, Paul, Corinne, and Amy. I understand uh, Ben has had to had to leave, um, and um, also Kath uh, and Abigail. So I think all of them have introduced themselves except for Abigail. So I'm just going to give Abigail 10 seconds to, to say who she is and what she's about. Abigail. Hi, uh, I'm Abigail Hathaway. So I'm from the University of Sheffield and I'm co-lead on theme two on this network, which is about ventilation for health. Thank you. OK, so we had a great set of presentations this morning and um, I took away many things, including the fact some people have their Sunday lunch much earlier than me, <laughs> which I picked up in Ben's presentation. Okay, so as Kath said, some great complementary uh, uh, um, uh, presentations, which really built on, on each other. Um, and we're happy to take questions in the, um, in the chat, in what has become the traditional manner. But I'll just kick things off with a, with a general uh, question uh, to the panel that was that was raised early on this morning, and that is, how has COVID impacted thinking around IAQ standards? Should they change based on the need to manage infection too? So does anybody want to make any comment about that on the panel? I can start. Yeah, yeah, I can, Thank I you, can start. I would say that it has changed the way people are considering buildings, including general public, because uh, I think many people discovered that uh, indoor air quality exists, and it's, it's even, even if it's not visible or even if we cannot perceive it, uh, there are pollutants in indoor air. So it has changed this, but I would not say that it has changed the standards, yet we, we don't see any ch real change in, in regulation or... We have uh, in France a recommendation of the uh, a council, a public health council recommendation to man how to manage building, but this remains recommendation at this stage. So we are we are on the way, but uh, not this. We are not at the end, and we uh, we need to make progress, and we we don't need to forget. So, uh, maybe in one year the the pandemic will be behind us, so we need to learn from what we have experienced over the past week and make make this change really in, in, in the facts. 
well, I agree with Corinne. <clears throat> um, I am, uh, you know, optimistic, but also a little bit pessimistic as well, because the question would be, so when pandemic is over, I mean, we go back to the, you know, the usual business. So my, my question is, is this only associated with the presence of infectious disease or infectious diseases or is it generally changed in the perception of the environment? And I think it's our sort of um, obligation now to make sure that people will, that, that will continue when the pandemic is over, that we just over and over remind people that uh, it's an, an important uh, issue, not only related to infectious diseases, but also to general health, uh, learning, you know, work performance and so on. And probably those arguments, we will have to bring them up uh, more pro profoundly um, uh, soon. Um, but uh, I think hopefully the um, behavior of people has changed. So uh, it seems like, um, you know, like we sanitize our hands all the time, seeing, you know, those sanitizers pleasant everywhere, at least in Denmark it is, that people still do it. Not everyone, but people are doing it whenever they enter supermarket. Hopefully they will also start opening windows at least, or at least when they are sitting in the small rooms with many people, they will sh somehow look for uh, uh, the ways how they can ventilate the space. So probably that will stay uh, with us. So that, that is a, you know, um, a very good um, change that we see. We need to keep it visible, don't we? Um, you know, we've, uh, COVID has made the invisible visible. And uh, how you just mentioned about hand washing, every time we go to the bathroom, we see the sink, we see yes. the water, we see the soap. Um, but, you know, people very quickly return to their old habits and, oh, it's cold in here, I'll shut the window type of thing. I'm, I'm hearing that more and more as we go into the into the heating season. So, you know, I do think um, and this was reflected in a number of the um, speakers this morning. I do think it's about it's about acting now, striking while the iron is as hot as it were. I, I see many hands, but I just want to say is that, and we need to make it visible. So although I have been, you know, and Kath also was mentioning that there are certain limitations for the CO2. I think we, we have no other choice. I mean, so we need to make it visible so people will see when they have to act. Maybe not by the number, but by the color, for example. When it's red, I mean, open window, do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah thank you. I think uh, Kath had a point and then Abigail. Kath? Yeah, I mean, so uh, looking at sort of standards, I don't think there's any hugely strong arguments come through to change any standards make them more stringent I mean but I think where it is highlighting is the vast number of buildings that don't comply with standards um, uh, uh, and so rather than you know making good buildings you know even more ventilated than they are now actually there's a real need to tackle those really poor spaces and as Pavel said we need to see it we need to find a way to see it but in doing that, we also need to not scare people with what they see um, and recognise that, that, you know, a, a metric of CO2, for example, is not a, it's not a sort of single safe, unsafe value threshold. It, it's a, a, a scale of <laughs> ventilation, <laughs> which makes it challenging. Yeah, thank you. Abigail, do you want to come in on? Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I was going to agree with all those points about the fact that suddenly indoor air quality is visible, but I think we probably shouldn't underestimate the challenge of getting across that it's about more than a, a pandemic, um, because a lot of people see that ventilation is this thing related to the pandemic, and particularly in the UK now that restrictions have relaxed, I have heard comments from business owners that they don't need to worry about ventilation any longer, you know, even though it's part of the building regulations. And I think getting that appreciation that actually ventilation is for wider aspects related to indoor air pollutants and health and rather than just to avoid catching a virus is something we need to kind of jump on and make clear sort of now. And so the visibility of ventilation is really important. I absolutely agree with Powell's points that, you know, it, it's not perfect, but CO2 monitoring is straightforward and we've got to find ways to make 
ventilation easy for the public to understand because it's I don't think we realize sometimes how technical what we're working is a lot of people don't get the difference between air conditioning and ventilation and that is and you start talking about it and they switch off because it's something technical and that's also I think a, a big challenge in moving forward to get people's affect people's behavior in buildings because we've seen today already that behavior has a big impact on this. Thank you Abigail. Paul, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just very, very brief, because I know that there is an, uh, an activity in Belgium, and we need to probably follow up on this, where I think the CO2 sensors are mandated in the spaces with the high risk. And, uh, you know, the, the spaces without CO2 sensors with a high risk, they will be closed. So if you want to know more about it, uh, probably we need to connect with our friends in Belgium. Yeah, thank you. I, I've I've been involved in a number of conversations with with various groups about the the idea of of um, putting labels on buildings and rooms in the same way as you might for energy performance certificates, saying this is a well ventilated space or this is a yeah this is a B rated space in terms of ventilation. Of course, you get you get completely caught up in the issues that Kath alluded to a moment ago in terms of, yeah, but how do you associate numbers with that? But I just wondered what the panel felt about just the principle of having labeling on buildings that say this is an A, a B or a C in terms of ventilation. Bit of a provocative one, perhaps. Can I chip in? Please do, Abigail, yeah. Um, I mean, I We've been talking about this in Sheffield and uh, you know, related to the, the pandemic, this ventilation is something people can't assess themselves. And actually some people are very scared to go back out. And the way of rating buildings, one way it, it shows up where there's problems, but also what's really important is can show when there's really good spaces and that can help get people back into buildings, which I think is really positive. I think one of the issues with ventilation is that, you know, it might be there might be um, a, a good system in place, but if we've seen behaviour may stop it working properly. But I think that's quite similar to a lot of the food hygiene standards. You have cafes have food hygiene standards tell you how good it is. That's only assessed at a point in time. And I'd see a sort of ventilation assessment system could be more similar to that um, in terms of we know that at that point in time, it was good. The systems are in place. Obviously, day to day, you don't know if someone's doing their, their job properly. Um, but we accept that for food hygiene. And it seems to work well in that respect. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. I and mean, I'd like to think that if we went down the route of labelling for ventilation, that the, the certificate would only be awarded after a period of after a period of monitoring, whether it be a month or two months or whatever. But um, yeah, we all pay attention to to any 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 food outlet that's got anything less than a five <laughs> noted on the uh, noted on the food certificate. So that's a it's, a it's a potentially great way of making ventilation visible. Tim. Yeah, no, it's an interesting idea. And just following on that point, I, I mean, I'm wondering if there is something that could or should be done about the the labelling of spaces or in terms of inst as instruction, it's not the right word, something which describes a space or a building in terms of, of, of what that ventilation sy system is and how it should be operated, how it should work. So, you know, is it mechanically vented? Where are the controls? How do the controls work? What, what, do, they, what do they do? Um, you know, done sort of similar things around, uh, you know, guidance for occupants of low energy homes, which is, the, you know, how is the building supposed to be used? What are the systems? You know, what do you turn on and turn off and so on? I think for a lot of people, they, you know, they walk into space, they don't really know where the controls are, you know, what's a switch, what's a light, what's a, a, a fan control or, or something like that. Um, you know, just so, something saying this room is, you know, is naturally ventilated. It uses the windows. This space has got a fan, and here's the switch for it. Uh, that might be perhaps helpful in, in raising that awareness a little bit. Oh, thank you. And um, yeah, just just a point to substantiate that, and then I'll come to Corinne. Um, a recent project I've been working on, and I don't wish to. Uh, give any more details on that. Um, going into spaces, talking to facilities managers about, so how should, how, 
what is the intended ventilation strategy for this space? And it's surprising the number of managers who don't know what the intention is for that space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just absolutely agree with that too. I mean, that's come from that experience. I've, I was speaking to somebody in our department who they thought they knew what the space is. When we walk around, it's different. Yeah. It turns out there's CO2 sensors which operate the system, but they didn't know that and they were broken. You know, it's all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Corinne. Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. What I wanted to say is that such labeling already exists, more or less, with the green building certification, uh, such as BREAM in UK. So we, we, we reviewed all the certification a few years ago and realized that you know, air quality was taken into account in all the, the, the main one, all the green building certification over the world, and ventilation was always considered. Uh, so maybe what we need is that. This, um, this, the, the requirements are more ambitious because it seems that most of the time all the buildings are green or premium or very high level, but so maybe we need to be more ambitious. And we also need to enlarge because few buildings are certified, it's expensive to be certified, so maybe it should be enlarged to, to be more accessible to anybody. And the last thing I wanted to say is I agree with Cass, we should not also scare people because imagine that the building is every day bad uh, in the schools. So what do we do? You're a parent. Do you leave your children in the school? So this is uh, we need to find the, the good compromise, the, the, the well balance between uh, warning people, but uh, not scaring them all, all the time also. So this this is mm -hmm. interesting and challenging. Those are great points, Corinne. Thank you. Um, very helpful. I'll take uh, a Powell's question and then Amy, and then I'll move on to another point. So, Powell, you're muted. I have I forgot to unmute myself. I think Amy was first, but it's fine. I, I just wanted oh. to say that um, the problem here is about responsibility. Uh, who takes the responsibility for the uh, systems that operate? And it will all depend on the type of a building. You think about public buildings, so who will take responsibility for that? Is this the owner or the user of the building? Who is the, uh, you know, who will take this? And then if you think about residential, and you have a leased uh, apartments, and then you have uh, owned apartments or own houses, right? So, I mean, if you own the house, probably responsibility will be going to you and then you need to learn about it. This is what Tim was saying. But if you rent from the company, probably you have very little freedom to change anything. So there should be someone else who is responsible for that. The issue is that I need to know when I have to react, right? And how to inform people about this. So they probably don't have to have a, um, a very you know comprehensive understanding of how ventilation uh, works and uh, so they need to be just alerted when necessary yeah thank you amy thank you malcolm yeah i was just going to pick up on on something that Powell said earlier about um about the the misconception that ventilation is always good um and if we're labeling um buildings as being as having high quality ventilation that that needs to take into account the air that's being brought into the building and the, the levels of pollution in that which maybe brings us back to measurements rather than I don't know what the solution to that is but just it's important to, to keep that at the forefront of our minds. No, thank you very much for that yeah I, I, uh, I noted that down this morning as a key point um, you know I've been talking in various um, forums over the last few years about ventilation effectiveness you know it, it's not just about 10 liters per second per person it's about how that air gets into the building how it's distributed etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh yeah thank you very much amy for bringing us back to that that's uh, that key point right okay i'm going to pick up on um a point that was raised in the chat this morning is question really do we know what the relevant indoor pollutants are, both primary and secondary? Um, I, yeah, I've heard, I've seen various lists for these uh, pollutants. Um, is it, is there more, is there more work needed here to, to identify and agree what primary and secondary pollutants are in the indoor space? Um, does anybody want to help me with a response to that?
references or uh, guidance? I am looking for a quote. I will help you in a moment. Uh, what I just want to say is that I think what we really need to agree on is, I mean, we have to be, uh, we need to find some compromise among us, right? Because we always look for the new compounds and new pollutants. But there is a lot of information on existing pollutants that we need to basically implement the uh, them in the and then uh, uh, how to say meet the uh, the guideline values and I, I think that is the very first important step and of course there will be new pollutants uh, coming all the time and that we cannot do anything about that but uh, we have to somehow. Um, uh, use the information that has already been uh, um, generated and created from the past. Uh, and I think we are not very good in doing this. And that this is the reason why we all the time debate. I mean, should we use this list or should we use this list and so on and so on. Yeah, I think it was in Corinne's um, presentation this morning where she identified 2,741 <laughs> potential substances in, in the indoor environment, uh, 206 of which were priority. And it, it just made me think about the, um, the types of sensors that we sometimes consider about installing in buildings, um, a CO2 sensor versus a, an air quality sensor. And I've had frustrating responses from manufacturers when I've asked them, um, so what does the air quality sensor sense? And what does 50% mean? And you know, to be told that it that uh, fifty percent means half of a hundred percent is is a wee bit frustrating. <laughs> so so yeah, understanding what's what's being sensed, and and ultimately, if you've got an indoor air quality sensor that's being used to control a ventilation system, then obviously it becomes it becomes even more important. Um, I just I'll just tag on to this a point that Jim raised in the in the chat, and that was: is there a need to have metrics for indoor? And for um, for sources of of indoor pollutants, so you know, not necessarily the 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 quality of a sample of air, but um, the um, the um, the release of sources in the space. Um, Jim's here on the call. I don't know whether you want to add anything to to that point. Whether I've captured that correctly, um, is there a need to have metrics for indoor environment sources? Anybody want to help me with that? I can start. We, we, Thank you, we, I think we, we need also to consider sources, but I th we should have different approaches in parallel. We should not have one, one approach and considering sources is also important. The problem is always the same. There are many, many sources, many, many substances in the sources. So we, we cannot regulate everything, but let's let's do a little bit, uh, some progress in this aspect. And labeling is very useful. I think uh, labeling of building material, labeling of cleaning products, so that uh, we reduce the amount of substances in, in, in the, in the, in the in the or, or we reduce the emission. Uh, labeling of, of furniture also this but we cannot la label everything we cannot control everything so in parallel we should also do measurement in the air quality measurement we should pu push all the all what we can push the sources the measurement the ventilation and all these efforts together will maybe will allow to reach a good indoor air quality um i can see who was first uh Kath. Just thinking, when it comes to sources, uh, I wonder if there's merit in actually collating together um, typical source um, emission rates into a into a sort of an agreed place. That yes, they're not perfect, and there'll be ranges in them. But um, you know, if if you want to then sort of look at how you model a new building, or or we, we need, you know, in, in the same way that, you know, if you model energy in a building or you model comfort in a building, you have some agreed parameters and agreed uh, uh, agreed approaches. Having a something similar for key indoor air pollutants, um, which then everybody was using the same sources of information, you could at least then start to compare between buildings when you're modelling them and, and when you're analysing what you're expecting to find. 
Thank you, Kat. Uh, Paul. I fully agree with Kat. Well, you know, Kat, uh, European Commission tried to make this exercise and Corinne was participating in this. And then, I mean, they had even, pro they have even proposal how to deal with this. And then um, it has never been implemented because there were disagreements. It's not that easy. Just want to say what Corinne was saying also earlier. And I think we should be, and Malcolm, that is, we should be, um, we should, I mean, at the moment, the full responsibility is on provider of ventilation, right? So, I mean, we can pollute the air outside, inside materials and so on and so on. And we believe that ventilation will deal with this. So we can open a window or provide ventilation. I think it's a it's responsibility on all stakeholders, responsibility for regulators of outdoor air and then responsibility of the material and product, building products producers. And then once, once this the responsibility will be just given to all those different stakeholders, probably the problem indoors will be easier to solve. I'm not sure it will be, but it may be. One important thing is that we are fighting against chemical industry that can always bring a supplement for whatever. We regulate one pollutant, they come up with another one and we need to wait years to find out whether this pollutant is harmful or not. So, or hazardous, right? So um, we don't know how to do it. So it, we have to also think about the technical solutions that will secure that, you know, we will be not mixing all the air, we will be capturing pollutants at source and so on and so on. So, I mean, it requires, I think, um, actions from, from different actors that uh, create the indoor uh, environment and indoor exposure. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, this point of um, out, outdoor outdoor air quality modelers and researchers talking to to indoor air quality modelers and researchers came up this morning, and and you know that that's that's really the drive for this network to make this happen. And you know I was getting excited by 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 Amy's presentation this morning about, whoa, there could be data here that we could translate into boundary conditions, depending on the spatial resolution, depending on the temporal resolution. And, you know, I think, I think FUVEN, our network needs to, needs to, to complete those links between the outdoor air quality and indoor air quality uh, uh, communities. And uh, just picking up on something Powell put into the chat this morning, which was, if I can find it, I think our first challenge is to limit the number of hazardous pollutants entering the indoor environment. Well, I'm sure Powell doesn't mean add more filters into the system. He means making sure that we reduce the sources of, of <clears throat> excuse me, of harmful contaminants in the outdoor environment. So um, it's great that we are talking together in this way. Um, that, that, that there's a couple of um, a couple of points raised about non-building environment. So um, the issue of submariners was raised this morning. We've heard that before. Uh, um, and, and also someone talked about um, whether there was any, any scope for setting standards for more uniform spaces, such as onboard trains. <coughs> I think that the uh, submariner one, if I remember correctly, from a year or two ago, has, has been a conversation that's been been uh, taken up at SIBC on quite a number of occasions, and that is the the harm that can be caused to to unborn children. Um, and I just wondered whether the panel had any points, any comments to make on um, non built environment spaces, so trains, trains, buses, um, or submarines, um, and if, if there's any any learning in either direction um, on on that point. I was gonna say, can I start? I mean, I, I think I, I think these are spaces that are often not thought about, and certainly when they are thought about, it's by you know there there are a handful of studies in the literature which have been driven by 
uh, researchers as opposed to the industries really taking some of this on board and particularly things like public transport environments you know there are, there is a lot more data on aircraft than there is on trains and yet we all travel on trains and buses far more frequently than we travel on aircraft um, and I think they are complex I, you know some of the measurements that you would do in a building don't necessarily work as well because let's say you go and measure CO2 on a bus or CO2 on a train you have an influence there from the fact that you've got um, exhaust fumes coming in um, which is not a good thing but it does mean it messes up some of your measurements so I think there's there is a requirement to do some much more detailed work there and you know a lot of those systems are designed around you know particularly long distance trains they have an issue that the they they have a, a power draw from that for that train and that that influences the amount of ventilation they can provide by the the power systems on the train. So I, I think you know the chat the solutions are not necessarily straightforward. Um, but yeah, I, I and I, I also think it's an environment which is a a challenging one because it's a public space, but it's a privately owned public space. We have no right to just go in and there and measure, and yet we are exposed without any choice. Thank you. Amy? Um, yeah, I was just gonna, it's a shame Ben's not here because his group have done some really interesting measurements um, looking at exposure levels in London on different modes of transport and uh, on cycling around and walking, you know, to try and show, to try and counter the idea that if air pollution is high, you should travel in your car, which is what some people think to be protected from the air pollution. And I think they showed that the highest air pollution concentrations were sitting in a car because of the, the, the drawing in the, the polluted air into the car. And, and being on a bus was also, I think I'm right. I can't remember the reference, but I there has been some really interesting work done by ERG in London on this kind of topic. Thank you. Okay, we are... We are out of time, but if there are any any final any final questions from um, from delegates or any points that any of our panel members wish to make before I uh, before I wrap up, then uh, please please shout up now. Okay, so um, in wrapping up, then there's lots I could say. I think there's been lots of there's been lots of agreement in terms of what the what the challenges are, what the issues are, what the opportunities are, and um, you know we started out with with Powell reminding us that um, that COVID has made has made indoor air quality more visible than ever, and um, and um, Ben uh, saying people are more engaged than ever. Um, we need to make it visible. So we talked about labelling, um, and um, but we need to act now people very quickly get back into their old habits and, and, um, and may forget about the, the importance of good ventilation. I found it really interesting um, when we were talking about labeling a few minutes ago, um, oh, allied to that is how is, this, how is this building intended to work in terms of its ventilation strategy? And you know, whoever made the point that people don't, understand the difference between ventilation and air conditioning and these terms get used interchangeably and they get confused and and confusion in something as important as public health is a is a dangerous thing um we've talked about misconceptions and and you know high ventilation doesn't necessarily mean good air quality and then Corinne uh, showed us some uh, CO2 readings with 10,000 parts per million, clearly, clearly not right. So uh, how do we select our sensors? And if we're gonna use sensors to control our indoor air quality and ventilation system, then they better be right. It better be commissioned. It needs to be maintained. Um, and I think what's, what's, what's come out time and time again, which I'm particularly pleased with is just the coupling of the indoor and outdoor science and the community and uh, you know, I'm really pleased that we've been able to get a great mixture of, of um, stakeholders representing both the indoor environment and the outdoor environment today. So, so I do thank, do thank all our speakers again, thank our panel members and, and thank all of our delegates for, for joining us. 
raising some really valid points, which um, given the technology we now all enjoy, we can take away and we can, we can use to hopefully make a difference now. Um, so that's my wrapping up. Uh, 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 Kath or Helen, I don't know whether there's anything else we, we need to report in terms of next events. No, I don't think so. I think we, we will be starting our seminar program in October again. Um, and it's, as I say, a, a thank you again to Pavel, Corinne and Amy and Ben, who's obviously disappeared. Um, so thank you very much for giving your time up this morning to attend and to speak. Um, really, really interesting conversation. Um, and um, hopefully we're on a the start of a the next stage of a journey onto getting better indoor air quality and outdoor air quality in our urban areas. <laughs>